Amen. John chapter 10 and verse 10. John chapter 10, verse 10. The Bible says, are you there? Say, I'm there. All two of you. All right, well, if you're not, then look on the screen because it's on the screen. John 10, 10. The Bible says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. The thief, the devil, Beelzebub, the enemy, the one that wants to kill, steal, and destroy your life. Now watch this. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Or your version of the Bible say, may say that Jesus has come to give you life and to give you life more abundant. Amen? Well, I thank God for that verse. I do. Now, let me just uh, set this whole message up because as many of you know who were here last week, by the way, if you were here last week, let me see your hand. All right, great. If it's your first time, we're so glad to have you. We're excited. Last week, we kicked off a brand new sermon series entitled Building Soul Quest, and basically we said that this, it's time. It's time for us to knock out our debt. It's time for us to prepare to build our own our very own worship center, our very own place right out here, wherever we are. That way or this way? Y'all don't know either, do you? Well, anyway, we got 25 acres of land somewhere on North Highland. I don't know which direction it is. I got some of y'all saying that way and some that way and some that way, so I don't know where it is. But anyway, uh, all right, thank you. But anyway... Uh, we have started a sermon series on building soul quests, and we, we kicked it off last week with just kind of an overview, and today we're going to be looking at the subject building lives. Now, over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at building lives, building families, building leaders, and building communities, because when we talk about building soul quests, we're not talking about just building a building. Listen, we've been building soul quests, and God has been building His church since the foundation of the church. Why? Because the church is not a building. The church is you, and the church is me, and so we are the church of the living God. But we are going to build our own building where the church can go into and sit and worship King Jesus. And I don't know about you, but I'm pumped about that. I'm pumped about that. But today I want to talk to you about building lives, building lives, building lives. When we first started this church, we, you, we had yard signs everywhere. We put them everywhere. We, we, uh, we had all kind of different sayings. One of them, one of our sayings was that we were a church doing church differently. Doing, so quest church, doing church differently. And that's exactly what we've done since we started this church. And because of that, and because of the blessings of God and the favor of God and the power of God, I believe that God has blessed us in really to the point where we have seen over 700 people stand to their feet and say yes to Jesus Christ in less than five years. That's pretty good stuff. I mean, that is really, really good stuff. So just think about this. And really... This has happened in less than adequate spaces. I mean, we were in the Star Center. Thank God for the Star Center. We met with there for the first four years of our ministry. Thank God for the Star Center. But it was a little less than adequate from what we really needed. And then God opened up the door for us to come here. Now, guys, listen, I love meeting in the gym. It's all, it's all good. Come on. It's all good. But there are some challenges that we have. So just think about this. If we've seen over 700 people in four and a half years say yes to Jesus, give their life to Jesus, can you imagine with me how many more would say yes to Jesus in a space that is ours, that we get to design, that we get to create in the vein of doing whatever it takes to reach those far from God and helping them take their next step towards spiritual maturity? Wow. It's going to be amazing. And so we're really, really excited about that. And it reminds me, it reminds me of two different construction projects that happened in the Old Testament. And when we read John 10, 10, we read two things in that verse. First of all, he says, I've come to give you life. Now remember, the Bible says in John 14, 6, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So 
Understand this. In John 10, 10, he said, I've come to give you life. And I believe that what he's talking about there is he's saying, I've come to give you Jesus. I've come to give you myself. I've come to give you eternal life. I've come to give you salvation. But he doesn't stop there. And the problem is that so many Christians stop there. He doesn't stop there. He said, I've come to give you life, salvation, eternity, a relationship with God, but not only have I come to give you life, but I've come to give you life more abundantly. I've come to give you life in full. we got a lot of people in our churches today that have life, eternal, life as far as salvation goes, but they have allowed the devil to steal their joy. And they don't have the abundance. They don't have life and to its fullest. Guys, listen, God, Jesus didn't just die on a cross so we can have fire in church. Jesus didn't just die on a cross so that we could go to heaven when we die. Jesus died on a cross to give us life, yes, but also to give us life more abundant. And there's two construction projects in the Old Testament that really talk about this. And I want to somehow or another connect. I'm not sure I did a very good job in the early service, but I want to somehow compare and contrast these two construction projects with John 10.10 10 and with where we are in our church today. Well, what are they? Well, first of all, you've got the ark that Noah built. Remember that? The ark that Noah built. And secondly, you have got the temple that Solomon built. So let's just back up and look at these just real quick, all right? Because there's some jumpy houses outside and some food. Somebody said there's some, some pulled, roasted Barbecued, smoked turkey somewhere out in the house. Anybody like that? Two things. Quick, th write them down. Number one, the ark. Uh, the ark, a saving place. The ark, a saving place. I want to give you two things about both construction projects. I want to give you the context. Watch this. I want to give you the context, and I want to give you the construction. What does this mean? Number one, the ark, a saving place, the context. Now I want to ask you if you would, look with me in Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. Genesis chapter 6, it'll be on the screen, verses 5, 6, 7, and 8. The Bible says this. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become. Now remember, God created man and woman. God created us, and something happened. What happened? Sin entered the world. Adam and Eve committed sin. They ate of the tree that God said, stay away from. They chose sin. Now, with that in mind, let's read it again. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness, in other words, they were messed up. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on earth had become and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil at all times. Does that sound familiar to you? Well, that's the world we live in today. The Lord was grieved that he had made man. In other words, he was upset. He, was, he repented that he made man. The Lord was grieved that he made man on the earth. And his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth. Men and animals and created creatures that move along the ground. And birds of the air. For I am grieved that I even made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of God. Here, here's the context, all right? Here's the context. God repented that he made man. And so what he decided to do was he was going to send a flood. Now, you say, well, preacher, do you, do you really believe that? I mean, do you really believe that, that this man took 120 years and built this big old boat and the earth was flooded? I absolutely do because it's in the Word of God. And, and so God repented that he made man and he was going to send a flood. And you might say, well, wait a minute, time out, time out. I don't think God would send a flood to destroy mankind. I mean, really, 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 preacher, don't you know, pastor, that our God is a God of love and a God of mercy and a God of grace? Oh, he is. He's every single bit of that. But let me also remind you that God's number one attribute is not His love, is not His grace, is not His mercy. God's number one attribute is His holiness. And everything falls under the umbrella of His holiness. 
His love falls under His holiness. His justice falls under His holiness. His mercy falls under His holiness. His wrath falls under His holiness. Listen, friend, because God is loving, God is also just. Because God is merciful, God also shows his wrathful side. Listen, friend, I'm telling you that our God is a holy God. What does that mean? That means that God cannot and will not look over sin in our lives. He won't look over sin. God is holy. You say, well, I, don't, I, I just don't know if I buy into that. Well, do you believe the Bible? We've got this story of the flood. Turn the pages a little bit, a few more pages over, you're going to find the, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. You go a little bit further and you go over to the New Testament, you're going to find story after, but you're going to find in Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira. I don't know if you remember that story or not, but Acts chapter 5, they lied to the Holy Spirit of God and God struck them down. You say, time out. That's, that's not the kind of God that, that I want to serve. Listen, friend, that is a holy God. Our God's holy. Thank God for his holiness because his holiness leads to love and mercy and grace. Our God is a holy God. He is gracious, merciful, but above all, he is a holy God. Now listen to this. He said he would destroy the earth again one day. You say, time out, time out. I, I saw a rainbow the other day, and that rainbow reminds me that God will never destroy the earth again. That's not what the rainbow reminds us of. The rainbow reminds us that God will never destroy the earth again with water. But the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verses 6 and 7 that God will destroy the earth one day with fire. Hmm. Well, time out, preacher, man. You're really encouraging me today. Well, I mean, are you a gloom peddler? I mean, come on, Pastor, are you a gloom? No, I'm a doom proclaimer. Judgment's coming, and that's the reason God had Noah build an ark. Can I tell you that the ark is symbolic of Jesus Christ? Here's the challenge today. If you don't have life, remember, Jesus said, I've come to give you life and give you life more abundant. I've come to give you life. I've come to give you life. I've come to give you life. Listen, here's the challenge today. If you don't have life, if you don't have a relationship with God, get in the ark. Get in Jesus. Come to Christ. Say yes to Jesus. Get in the ark. Then the Bible says here, not only the context, but I want you to see the construction. What do you mean? Well, chapter 6, verses 14, 15, and 16. Listen to this. He said this. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you were to build it. Now, he gives them specific instructions how to build it. Why? Because this boat, this ark was built on purpose. It had certain compartments. They built it. He built it to God's specifications. It was built on purpose. Let's read on. The ark is to be 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Make a roof for it and finish the ark to within 18 inches of the top. Put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. In other words, it's three stories. It's a, this is a big boat. I am going to bring floodwaters on the earth and destroy all life under the heavens, every creature that has breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish. Here is the wrath of God, the holiness of God. But here's the construction. By the way, I think it's very cool that every time, if not every time, I think every time, but when he sends judgment to the earth, he always provides a way out for the child of God. Every time. I mean, when the flood came, guess what happened? He built an ark. When the flood came, he built an ark. When, when God was about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he told Lot, he said, hey, Lot, get your family out. And find as many righteous people as you can find and get them out of Sodom and go because the judgment of God is about to fall. Every time, and, you, and here's the deal, one of these days at the end of time, when the Lord Jesus comes back, the Bible says there's going to be a period, a seven-year period. It's called the Great Tribulation Period. The first three and a half years will be unity on earth. The second three and a half years of the tribulation, it's going to be hell on earth. 
Guess what? I'm not going to be here. Some of you say, well, I believe, I I, I don't believe in the rapture. I believe that we're going to live through the tribulation. Well, go right ahead. I'll be gone. Stay if you like. But when the the trumpet sounds, friend, this preacher is going to take off out of here. Listen, I'm going to fly without wings. I'm going to be gone. And so what happens is, before judgment falls, oftentimes he takes his children out first. But this is what's so interesting. The Bible says that, that this boat, the ark, is 450 feet long. That's pretty big. That is amazingly very similar to a modern-day ocean liner. This gym from wall to wall is about 85, 86, 87 feet long. The ark was 750 feet long. Pretty big, huh? He built it on purpose. Now, guys, listen to me. When we build our building, it's going to be built on purpose. It's going to be built on purpose. We're not just going to throw a building up. We're going to build it on purpose. And everything that we do as a church, including building a facility, is going to have to, first of all, run through the vision of the church and run through the mission statement of the church. And if it doesn't fit in there, then we don't need that part of the building. We're going to build it on purpose so that we can continue to do whatever it takes to reach people far from God and to help them take their next step towards spiritual maturity. Now, guys, listen, here's here's the construction process. We're also building specifically a state-of-the-art worship area. We're not going to have a gym floor where the sound just echoes everywhere. We probably will not have north side blue windows. We're going to have a state-of-the-art kids area. Why? Because we are a church that is building for the next generation. We are Listen, Christianity is one generation from extinction. That's why we as a church have always put as a priority to reach the next generation. And that's the reason we do church a little bit different, because we want to reach a generation that is not being reached. Therefore, how about we have a state-of-the-art kids' area, baby's area, and how about an indoor McDonald's, better than McDonald's play area? Won't that be cool? So that we can bring children in and preach the gospel so that they can experience life through Christ. Because that's what's going to change the next generation. Listen, listen, friend. I don't want to get off on all this political stuff. We see enough of that on television. Aren't you glad the political ads are over? But I want to tell you something. It's not the Democrats and it's not the Republicans and it's not the independents that's going to change America. It's the message of life through Jesus Christ. That's it. And so here we have Noah building the ark. Why? For the salvation of people. Noah preached and pleaded for 120 years. No one listened. Can you imagine preaching and no converts at all? But he built it for purpose. Why? Because the flood was coming. Now, let me just tell you real quick. The ark was a safe place. That's really big. The ark was a safe place. When they got inside of that ark, man, I'm telling you, that boat was so big. You ever been on a cruise? Anybody ever been on a cruise? Everybody been on a, a, one of the biggest boats, you know? By the way, did y'all see where they're bringing Titanic back again? Who wants to ride that? No, me either. <laughs> I ain't going to get wrecked again. And so, so you got this massive boat, and inside of it, you're safe. The Lord shuts the door from the outside. You can't get out. You're safe on the inside. Listen, the church of the living God ought to be a safe place. It's safe for whoever you are. Red, yellow, black, or white, they're all precious in His sight. No matter what you did last night, no matter what your stronghold is, no matter what your addiction is, you can come to the house of God. Listen, friend, you can come to the house of God and you're not going to be judged, but you're going to be accepted. Yes, the Word of God is going to be proclaimed, but the grace of God is going to come and give you a chance to accept life in Christ. Safe place, but also not only a safe place, but it is a saving place. Thank God for that. 
the, the, the ark. It's a saving place. But then we shift gears and we go a few hundred years to the right, through the Old Testament, and you come to the temple. The temple is a growing place because, watch this, watch this. John 10.10 10 says, I've come to give you life, but also to give you life more abundantly, life more full. Here's the problem in Christianity today. Are you ready, Sam? Ready? Here's the problem. The problem is we got a lot of people that want life and they get life, but they don't want to go through the process of growing in their faith and becoming more like Jesus so that not only they have life, but they can have life abundantly. The temple, a growing place. A growing place. Exodus chapter 25, verses 8 and 9, we see where Moses built a tabernacle. You say, what's a tabernacle? Well, in 1 Kings 6, 1, we're going to get there in a moment, but in 1 Kings 6, 1, we, we, we know that there was a temple being built, but before the temple, they worshipped in a tabernacle. Now, what's a tabernacle? A tabernacle is a portable church. A tabernacle is on wheels, man. Everywhere they went, they brought the church with them. The tabernacle was a temporary dwelling for, the, for, for God. It was, the tabernacle was set up and tore down. They knew what it was like. They knew what we did. They did it all the time. What did the tabernacle, what did they do in the tabernacle? Well, the same thing they do in the temple, but the tabernacle, it was a place to meet God. Watch this. It was a place to meet God. It was a place to be reminded that we're not God. And it was a place where we could respond to God. Now, now follow me. The tabernacle was a place where you could meet God. It was a place where you could be reminded that you're not God, but it was a place where you could respond to God. Can I just tell you that the house of God, the church of the living God, is the same place today? This is a place that you can come. Listen, friend, you can, not that God is just hanging out in the church all during the week. No, if you're a child of God, he's hanging out in your heart. But when you come corporately to worship God, you can meet with God. You can be reminded through the preaching and the worship that you're not God, but then you're going to get an opportunity to respond like we do every week. You can respond to God. The temple, 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1. So here we have the tabernacle, and now Solomon says it's time. It's time to build a permanent facility. It's time to stop Wandering around, it's time to stop having church on wheels, and it's time to build our own facility, brick and mortar and wood. Now it's time. First Kings chapter 6, verse 1, here it is. In the 480th year, after the Israelites had come out of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, a second, the second month, he began to build the temple of the Lord. So now the temple is being built. You say, what does this have to do with the growing place? Because the temple was so important in the Jews' life. It was a place where they went out on a daily basis, a weekly basis. It was a place of sacrifice. It was a place of festivals. They celebrate the Passover there. It was a place of ceremonies. They had the Day of Atonement there. It was a place of tithing. You say, I knew you was going to get giving in somewhere. That's right. It was a place of tithing. They, poured, they gave to the local storehouse. It was a, behind the temple that was this gathering place. And they brought their, their tithe. They didn't, they didn't have money. Like, they didn't write checks. They brought stuff. Chickens. Don't be bringing me no chickens. Eggs. Goats. Lambs. Spotless lambs. And they brought their tithe Maybe money, gold, and they put it in the storehouse. That's where the word storehouse comes from, Malachi chapter 3, verse 3. They put it in the storehouse so that there would be no need in the house of God. You see, they would, they, it was a place of tithing. It was a place of unification. All the tribes of Israel, now follow me, all the tribes of Israel came together at the temple. I think this is very interesting because all the tribes were different. 
God never intends on his church for us all to look alike and sound alike and believe everything alike. But there are some things that we've got to come together on. The deity of Christ. Jesus was born of a virgin. We, we got to understand that, that, that Jesus lived a sinless life. Because he was the perfect sacrifice, he, he died on the cross for our sins. He died. He didn't fall asleep. He wasn't in a coma. He died. Three days later, Jesus Christ came up out of the tomb, and he is alive today. Friend, I got news for you. If you're watching, listen to me. Buddha is still dead. Confucius is still dead. Mohammed is still dead. John Smith is still dead. Jesus is not dead. Jesus is alive. We got to come together on some basic things. We got to believe if you're going to be a part of, 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 of Christianity and specifically this church, you're going to buy into the fact that Jesus left us one thing to do before he ascended into heaven. He said, I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every single Christian or every single creation of mine. You see, the Jews were unified in the temple. Guys, you're not, we're not all going to look alike, sound alike. Believe everything alike, but there's something about coming together because it brings unification in the body. That's exactly what they did. And so all these things helped them to grow in their faith. The Bible says in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 2, the construction, that was the context, but here's the construction. The Bible says in verse 2, the temple uh, that King Solomon built for the Lord was 60, watch this, 60 cubits long. 20 wide and 30 high. Now, in our measurements, what that means is 60 cubits, 90 feet long. About the length of this gym, a little bit longer. 30 feet wide. 45 feet high. Had a porch on it, 180 feet high. This basketball court is 84 feet long and 50 feet wide. What you are sitting in today, right now, right here, is about the size of the temple in the Old Testament. And I don't have time because we're already running over time, but I don't have time, but in the temple there were basically two, two major areas. There's the, there is the holy place and there is the holy of holies. The holy of holies is where God was and nobody was allowed in except for the priest. And because the, pri the priest went in even with fear and trembling. They would tie a rope around the priests because they were going in to the Holy of Holies. And you know what was in the Holy? The Shekinah glory of Almighty God. And so if something happened, if that priest had some sin in his life, he may not make it out. They could pull him out by the rope. Friend, listen to me. Praise God. Let me cut this thing short. Listen to me closely. We don't have to go through a priest anymore. When Jesus Christ died on the cross and came up out of the tomb. The Bible says that when the earthquake came, that the, 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 the curtain in the Holy of Holies was split in half, and He was saying to us, no longer, no longer do you have to go through a priest. No, you can go straight to the Father without fear and trembling. Now you can come to the Father with boldness. Boldness before the throne of God. Friend, I'm telling you, if you don't have a prayer life, Get a prayer life because you can talk to God. Wow. Guys, listen to me. Let me close with this. Somebody play some music for me. I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and close this thing. The Bible says in the holy place, there was basically three, three pieces of furniture. There's a holy place and then there's the holy place. In the holy place, there are basically three pieces of furniture. There's the golden lampstand. It provided light. Can I remind you, my dear friend, look at me. Can I remind you that Jesus said that I am the light of the world? The Bible says that in this holy place, there was an altar of incense. Wisp of smoke began to rise up. Friend, we don't need an altar of incense anymore because our prayers to God are just like wisp of smoke rising to heaven. The Bible tells us it was a table of showbread. It was a
day-old bread. Anybody ever bought day-old bread because it's cheaper? I remember when I was a kid. My mom and dad were in here in the early service. There was a place in Milan, Tennessee across the tracks. It was called Wonder Bread. Anybody remember that? You could go in there and had day-old bread. Now, it wasn't molded or anything, but it was day-old. It was not as fresh. You could buy it cheaper. They had day-old bread and maybe even molded bread. It was no good. It was a table of showbread. But can I remind you that Jesus said to give us this day our daily bread. God wants the best for you. God wants fresh bread for you. He's the bread of life. He's the water of life. Oh, friend, He's the light of the world. And the Bible says in the temple, they would bring money as they sacrificed And if the money, if the gift was accepted, they left singing. If the sacrifice of money was accepted, they left singing. But now today, we enter the presence of God singing. We don't wait for somebody to say it's acceptable or not. We enter the presence of God singing. And because of that, we give to God out of a grateful heart. You see, they gave us a sacrifice. We give because it's a blessing to give back to God because He's blessed us so much. Hmm. Friend, listen to me. It's very interesting to me that in the Old Testament, God had a temple for His people. He had a temple for His people. But in the New Testament, in our day, God has a people for His temple. When we build a building, when we break ground and we get some walls up out there on our new land, we're not building a church. Don't even say it. Don't use that verbiage. We're not building a church. We're building a building for the church. We're not building a church. We're building a building so that the church of God, Soul Quest Church, so that the church, why? Because Jesus lives inside of us. We're the church. We're building a building so that the church, watch this, watch this, this is interesting, so that the church could go into the building and get pumped up and worship corporately because the Bible says not for, to forsake the assembling of yourselves together. We come into the building. The church comes into the building. Why? To worship and to pray and to preach and to sing and to give. But then we leave the building and we go out back in the world. The church leaves the building and goes back into the world because in the world is where people need life. You see, Noah's ark was a place of life. The temple was a place of growth. And I guarantee you that I'm sitting here or standing here today looking at some folks. And folks, listen, I've been there myself. Listen to me. I've been there myself. Oftentimes we have life, salvation. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. But because of sin in our life, because of challenges in our life, because of of, of valleys of the shadow of death in our life, because of trials and tribulations, we veer away from God. We have life because when we get in the ark, God shuts the door. God locks the door. You can't get out if you want to. He loves you no matter what you do. You can't get out. You have life. But you've allowed, we've allowed the devil to steal life abundantly. We've allowed the devil to steal life in its fullness. We've allowed the devil to steal our joy. We've allowed the devil to steal our every single day commitment to God. We've allowed the devil to steal our prayer time and our Bible. Oh, we have life, but we don't have it more abundantly. We have salvation, but we're not growing in our faith. I don't wonder if there's anybody here like that today. you got life, but you're not walking with God daily. Your ear, 
ill, you're irritable, you're angry. There's nobody in. The, look, I'm preaching to myself today. The most miserable person in the world is not the lost man. The most miserable person in the world is the person who has life, but they're outside of the will of God and they don't have it more abundantly. You know why you're miserable? Because you're not letting God lead you. Listen, you got all of God you can get, but the question is not, do you have all of God? The question is, does He have all of you? Life. The ark. Abundant life. Life in its full growth. The temple. Where are you, friend? Where are you? 